I think many of you will agree that the older we get, the more interesting history seems to us. And although we spent many hours studying this subject at school, there are always new and amazing facts that we have never heard of. In this video, I present to your attention a selection of historical episodes that you were not told about at school. Enjoy watching. If you were asked to describe a Viking, most likely in your imagination, a Scandinavian bloodthirsty warrior in a horned helmet, armed with axes, would appear. Indeed, the stereotype of a certain image of Vikings is firmly entrenched in our thinking. But does it coincide with who they really were? The Viking era fell in the early Middle Ages, from the 8th to the 11th century. Vikings were Scandinavian seafarers who made impressive sea voyages for those times. Interestingly, they were the first to reach America and founded their settlements on the territory of modern Canada. Historically, Vikings did not look at all like we are used to imagining them. For example, these men wore ordinary helmets without any horns. Such an image arose after the premiere of Wagner's opera The Ring of the Nibelung in 1876. Horned helmets were used in this production. According to another myth, inspired by movies, Vikings liked to be alone with a large number of women. Modern technologies have allowed scientists to find out that in reality, Scandinavian seafarers were faithful to their spouses. Moreover, they went on voyages with their families. And in conclusion to the topic of Vikings, it should be noted that they were not uneducated savages. There is evidence that many of them were interested in painting, wood carving, and metal stamping. Sometimes the Statue of Liberty is incorrectly associated with immigration. On October 28, 1886, during the grand opening of the Statue of Liberty, thousands of people gathered. That day, U.S. President Grover Cleveland gave his speech, but it did not contain a word about America's immigrants. The statue was a gift from France. Its sculptor, Frederick Auguste Bartholdi, saw his creation as a symbol of freedom and equality, as well as friendship between France and the U.S. But why then has this world-famous sculpture come to be associated with immigration? It turns out that the blame lies with the sonnet The New Colossus by American poet Emma Lazarus. In it, Emma portrayed the statue not as a symbol of freedom, but as a symbol of assistance to refugees for whom America had become a refuge. There are other myths associated with the Statue of Liberty, which I may tell you about in other videos. By the Little Ice Age, a certain period of time is meant when there was a strong cooling. Such periods have occurred on Earth more than once. Almost all Ice Ages happened a very long time ago, but one of them was even caught by people from the Middle Ages. The Little Ice Age began in 1303 and ended only in 1850. With its arrival, people's lives changed dramatically, and they had to literally survive in extreme conditions. The inhabitants of European countries suffered the most. They found themselves at the mercy of incredibly harsh winters. Summer during this period was also very cold, and in the 17th century, it was even anomalous. For several years in July and August, frosts hit. This led to the fact that agricultural lands began to bring little harvest, which provoked famine. At this time, a huge number of animals died. In some European regions, in winter, birds froze to death in flight. The exact number of dead people is unknown. Some of them died of starvation, some from diseases, and some from hypothermia. Paintings of the time helped to imagine the conditions in which people had to survive. Artists often depicted nature and people during the Little Ice Age in their works. For example, in the painting Breaking the Ice by the English artist George Moreland, you can see how a family tries to draw water from a frozen reservoir during an icy wind. Scientists suggest that the Little Ice Age arose as a result of a slowdown in the Gulf Stream. In addition, at this time, there was an increase in volcanic activity, as well as a decrease in solar activity. Now we are observing the opposite phenomenon, global warming, which, like the Little Ice Age, is fraught with serious consequences for our planet, and accordingly, for people. I think most of you are used to considering Napoleon Bonaparte a short man. In fact, this is one of the most common myths about the great French leader. 
But where did this rumor come from? In English-speaking countries, Napoleon was considered short due to equating French units of length to English ones, even though English feet and inches are slightly shorter than the French ones. Napoleon's height, recorded after his death, was 5 feet 2 inches 4 lines or 170 centimeters. The English did not translate this value into their units of measurement, after which the height of the commander was reduced by almost 10 centimeters. It was after this error that the myth of the short Napoleon was born. In fact, his height was average for a French man of that time. Linguistics is directly related to history, and this suggests that English, like most other languages, has constantly changed. The English language is a West Germanic language that originated from Anglo-Frisian dialects. There are three stages in the development of its modern form, Old English, Middle English, and Modern English. It is believed that Old English appeared in the 450s AD when the British Isles began to be settled by the Angles, Saxons, and Jutes. This version of the language was completely different from what we know now. Middle English began to emerge in the 10th century AD. At that time, Normandy and England became a single state. Therefore, the language gradually changed under the influence of Norman or Old French. It was at this stage of development that the English language became well understood to modern people who know it. Modern English appeared partly thanks to Shakespeare. He personally introduced at least 2,200 new words and slightly adjusted the use of verbs. Now English is an international language spoken by over 2 billion people. Ketchup is the most popular tomato sauce in the world. But did you know that tomatoes were not originally an ingredient in it? Ketchup is believed to have originated in China. There, the main ingredient of a sauce called gate soup was minced fish. In the early 18th century, British merchants were amazed by the unusual taste of this sauce and brought it home. From that moment, the recipe for ketchup began to change. The British experimented with ingredients, adding mushrooms, nuts, fruits, and oysters to the sauce. The familiar tomato ketchup appeared only in 1876. The first company to produce this sauce was the American brand Heinz. At that time, the unknown product aroused suspicion among people. To increase the level of trust among customers, Heinz decided to sell their ketchup in transparent glass bottles, so everyone could see what was inside. Gradually, the sauce became popular in the USA and then all over the world. Arguably, one of the most mysterious and strange epidemics was the Dancing Plague. In 1518 in Strasbourg, a certain Madame Trophea left her house and started to dance in the street. Gradually, the townspeople watching this action began to join her. People danced round the clock. Some of them fell from exhaustion, but after resting, continued to dance. After a week, more than a thousand people were already participating in the dances. Then the city authorities decided to cure the sick. It should be said that at that time, the methods of medicine often implied treatment of the like with the like or bloodletting. In this case, a municipal building was allocated for the sick, where an orchestra was invited and several dozen sick people were brought. But this method did not help. Then it was decided to proceed to the second plan of action. The doctors began to perform bloodletting. However, this did not save people either. Eventually, the authorities massively transported all the dancers out of the city and did the same with new patients. This way, they managed to get rid of the epidemic. Interestingly, the outbreak in Strasbourg is not the only case of the dancing plague. It is known that a similar epidemic was recorded in the 14th century in France, in the 15th century in Belgium, and even in the 19th century in Madagascar. The nature of this disease remains unknown. Scientists suggest that it could have been caused by mass food poisoning with psychoactive substances of ergot. This type of fungus is a parasite that affects cereals. The last queen of Hellenistic Egypt, Cleopatra VII, is still considered one of the most beautiful women of all mankind. All the known Egyptian queens preceding her were Egyptians. Cleopatra, however, had different roots. Her ancestor was Ptolemy I Soter, the main assistant to Alexander the Great. 
In 325 BC, his loyalty to serving Macedonia was rewarded with the title of ruler of Egypt. From that moment, the Ptolemaic dynasty, ruling Egypt for 275 years, was founded. All rulers from this dynasty were Macedonians. This ancient people is traditionally considered to be ethnic Greeks. Therefore, Cleopatra can be regarded as a Greek of Macedonian descent. Despite this, she always identified herself with Egypt. Cleopatra became the first ruler from the Ptolemies who learned the Egyptian language and wore traditional clothing for Egyptian queens. Aqueducts, or irrigation channels, were an important achievement of ancient Rome. Thanks to them, water supply and sewage systems began to function in the city. The first aqueduct was built as early as 312 BC. After people realized how convenient they were, aqueducts began to appear one after another. Most of the channels were located underground. Sometimes ravines and pits were encountered along the way of the water conduits. But ancient Roman engineers found a way out of this situation and began to build above-ground structures. These were arch bridges, and for greater stability, the arches were built in tiers. Some of them have survived and are still in use today. The most famous of them, the Pont du Gard, is located in France. Ancient Romans built aqueducts from stone, brick, volcanic rocks, and concrete. Their construction was precisely thought out, from the planning stage to commissioning. Ancient Roman engineers always built aqueducts at an angle so that water would flow down the pipes on its own. Therefore, they used many geodetic instruments such as analogs of levels, angle meters, odometers, and other devices. Thanks to archaeological excavations, scientists learned that before installing a pipe, the Romans made a stone substrate. The pipes always had a U-shape and were large enough for a person to fit inside in case of necessary repairs. An arch-shaped roof was installed over the pipe. To protect the aqueducts from dust and dirt, they were plastered. In damp places, a drainage system was used to drain groundwater. Ancient Roman aqueducts are incredibly complex structures. Despite their age of more than 2,300 years, many of them have been well-preserved and are capable of serving people for many more thousands of years. After the First World War, about 5,000 Australian soldiers were given land plots in the west of the country. But they could not enjoy this for long, as an entire flock of emu ostriches invaded their territories. About 20,000 birds swept away everything in their path. They destroyed crops, knocked down fences, and depleted water supplies. Of course, the emus made life difficult for people, dooming them to starvation without a harvest. Therefore, in 1932, it was decided to start a war with these birds. In history, this struggle is known as the Great Emu War. It would seem, what's the problem just to exterminate all the ostriches? But it turned out to be very difficult. Australians developed a whole tactic for killing the birds, but even this did not help them. The fact is that emu ostriches are some of the largest birds in the world. They can grow up to 180 centimeters and weigh 45 kilograms. Despite this, they are capable of running at speeds of up to 48 kilometers per hour and always travel in flocks. After numerous complaints from farmers, the Australian Minister of Defense, George Pierce, sent an entire army armed with Lewis machine guns to fight the birds. The soldiers set up many ambushes but most of their attacks ended in failure because the emus sensed the threat and managed to escape, while the people, inspired by victory, completely miscalculated the range and accuracy of the shooting. Only during one single battle did people manage to kill about a thousand birds. The Ministry of Defense admitted that it could not continue this war and left the farmers alone with this problem. This story teaches that you should never underestimate the enemy, even if they are birds, especially as smart as emus. Mount Rushmore became a famous American landmark after the faces of four U.S. presidents were carved into its granite rock in 1825, according to the project of sculptor Gutzon Borglum. Few know that this mountain was previously a sacred place for the native inhabitants of America and had a different name. In the Lakota language, it was called Tunkasila Sakpe Paha, or Mountain of Six Grandfathers. 
The mountain was considered a sacred abode of the spirits of the Lakota, Cheyenne, and Arapaho ancestors. But everything changed with the arrival of colonizers in the Black Hills. In 1884, New York lawyer Charles Rushmore visited the area to find a suitable place for founding a mine. He was amazed by the beauty of the mountain and later allocated a lot of money to create the famous relief. Therefore, the mountain was named after him. So, behind the beauty of this world-famous landmark lies a sad story that reminds us of the unfortunate fate of the indigenous inhabitants of the Black Hills. We all know that George Washington was the first president of the USA, elected by the people. He is considered the founder of the USA and one of the main symbols of the American people. But few people know about his serious ailment. When Washington was 20 years old, for an unknown reason, his teeth, one after the other, began to fall out. They say that when he took office as president in 1789, he had only one tooth left. Washington understood that he looked unesthetic, so he turned to Dr. John Greenwood. A denture was made especially for him. By the way, for a long time it was believed that his prosthesis was made of wood. But this is just a myth. Wood, under the influence of moisture, being in the mucous membrane of the mouth, would quickly become unusable. And making such a prosthesis, especially for the president, would be impractical. Therefore, in fact, the denture was made of bones. During his entire life, the doctor made four prostheses, which Washington wore throughout his life. They were made of the bones of hippos, elephants, and even humans. This whole structure was supported by a gold plate. John Greenwood became the first dentist to make dental prostheses from ivory. Thanks to this invention, Washington could appear in public and clearly pronounce his speeches. Famous copies of the president's dentures are now kept in museums in Baltimore and New York. Some Americans believe that Benjamin Franklin wanted the country's symbol to be not the bald eagle, but the turkey. But this is a myth. Among the symbols he proposed were the images of Moses and the Egyptian pharaoh. But where did the rumors about the turkey come from? The fact is that in 1776, he sent a letter to his daughter, in which he wrote that it would be better if the country's symbol was not the bald eagle, but the turkey, because this brave and feisty bird could attack even the best English soldier without fear. This letter was humorous. Franklin did not particularly like bald eagles because they can feed on carrion, which he found very disgusting. Therefore, he said that it would be better if the emblem of America was a turkey. The construction of the Great Wall of China began in the 3rd century BC. From school textbooks, we know that it was intended to protect against enemy raids. Undoubtedly, this is logical, and basically, it was so. However, historians believe that protection was not the only purpose of the wall. At least two hypotheses have been put forward about this. According to the first, the Great Wall of China could serve as a transport highway. Since its width reached five and a half meters, two carts could pass inside the wall. But on the other hand, no such information about this purpose was found in the chronicles. Moreover, the costs of such construction would not cover the income. According to the second hypothesis, the Great Wall of China helped solve the problem of employment of the population. Its construction could serve as an ideology of the nation to unite the inhabitants and strengthen the kind. The microwave oven is an essential attribute of the modern kitchen. Thanks to its invention, people save a lot of time on reheating, defrosting, and cooking food. The history of this electrical appliance can be traced back to 1920. That year, tube radio transmitters were developed, which made it possible to use high-frequency radio waves for heating substances. Thirteen years later, in 1933, at an exhibition in Chicago, the Westinghouse Company demonstrated how quickly food placed between two metal plates, connected to a shortwave transmitter, could be cooked. All these discoveries gradually led to the creation of the first device for fast food preparation. However, it is believed that the person who led to the creation of microwave ovens was the American engineer, Percy Spencer. This is because he first noticed the ability of ultra-high frequency radiation to heat food, 
continued to study this effect and patented the microwave oven. In the summer of 1945, Spencer was conducting experiments with another magnetron in his laboratory. Suddenly, he noticed that the chocolate bar in his pocket had melted. At first, he was surprised by this, and then he realized what was happening. On October 8, 1945, he filed a patent application for the microwave oven. It was a successful invention, and two years later, the American military industrial company Raytheon released the world's first microwave oven, Raytorange. Initially, this device was designed exclusively for military canteens. It could quickly defrost food. In 1949, mass production of the Raytorange began. It cost $3,000, but it was impossible to use it at home, as it was over 160 centimeters tall, weighed about 340 kilograms, and had a power of 3 kilowatts. The first domestic microwave oven was released in 1955 by the American company Tappan Company. Then the demand for the appliance was low, but today it is almost indispensable. The Gregorian calendar was introduced on October 15, 1582 by Pope Gregory XIII, replacing the previously used Julian calendar. And to this day, it is used in most countries of the world. The Gregorian calendar is based on the cyclic rotation of the Earth around the Sun. According to it, the earthly year is 365.242 days, and there are 97 leap years in every 400 years. The difference between the Julian and Gregorian calendars, at the time of the introduction of the latter, was 10 days. But due to the different number of leap years, this difference gradually increases by 3 days every 400 years. The decision to adopt the Gregorian calendar led to mass protests even among Catholic scientists. The innovation was called distortion of the Julian calendar and was refused to be accepted. Pope Gregory XIII even had to threaten the protesters with excommunication from the church. The first to adopt the Gregorian calendar were Spain, Portugal, Italy, the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, and the Kingdom of Poland. Saudi Arabia was the last to support the Gregorian system of time calculation in 2016. Christopher Columbus is known as one of the most outstanding navigators. However, even he could make a serious error in his calculations, thus discovering an entirely different continent than he sought. When Columbus decided to find the rich land of India, he was already an experienced sailor and had been to Africa, England, Iceland, and Ireland. He believed that since the Earth is round, sailing west would reach Asia. However, at that time, it was believed that the Earth was significantly smaller than it actually is. On August 3, 1492, he set off in search of Asia. Along with him, 90 people participated in the expedition, distributed on three ships, Pinta, Nina, and Santa Maria. Columbus headed west, confident that he would arrive where he wanted. But things turned out differently. As a result of this journey, he reached the Bahamas and Haiti. Mistaking this land for India, he called the local people Indians. Interestingly, it was after this incident that the indigenous people of America began to be called Indians. During his subsequent voyages, he continued to search for India but instead discovered Central and South America. It would have been correct to name America Columbia, but this did not happen since he continued to consider the discovered lands as Asia. Only between 1497 and 1502 did the Italian explorer Amerigo Vespucci mark America on maps not as Asia but as an unknown continent. The real life of pirates was nothing like what is shown in movies. For instance, in Pirates of the Caribbean, the buccaneer ships are depicted as majestic vessels with an abundance of food, drink, and entertainment. But in reality, pirates often had to cram themselves onto small, old ships. The sanitary conditions on pirate ships were terrible. On their ships, they transported live cattle, which became the cause of various diseases. Pirates had to relieve themselves in a place at the bow of the ship, called the head. Due to poor nutrition, sea robbers often suffered from stomach diseases and scurvy. There were also problems with clean water on the ship as it quickly became stale in barrels. However, the pirates had rum. 
but they drank it not for fun. Pirates diluted stale water with rum because otherwise it was simply impossible to drink it. In addition to all of the above, the life of pirates was full of dangers. They could be killed during attacks on other ships, and they also often got into shipwrecks. So the beautiful, carefree life of adventurers and rebels was not at all what it might seem to us. In 295 BC, on the orders of Ptolemy, a museum was built in Alexandria, a kind of prototype of a research institute where local philosophers worked. Ptolemy wanted to attract the most famous thinkers to the museum, but didn't know how. Then his advisor, Demetrius of Phalerum, suggested importing many books from all over the world. And this plan worked. Plato and Xenodotus of Ephesus came to Alexandria. Xenodotus became the first keeper of the library, and with the money allocated from the treasury, bought about 5,000 unique books of that time. Later, the library's collection began to be replenished by ships entering Alexandria. The ships were checked for manuscripts, and if found, they were confiscated, returning a copy to the owners. The original always remained in the library. Thus, the Library of Alexandria at that time became the largest library in the world. Its archive contained about a million different manuscripts. Even by modern standards, this figure is impressive. The library stored Greek literature, works of Jewish, Egyptian, and Babylonian thinkers. It was within its walls that the first translation of the Old Testament into Greek was carried out. In addition, important scientific discoveries were made in the library. There were laboratories and a medical school at the library. The Library of Alexandria was not just a book repository, but a real scientific center. Unfortunately, the Library of Alexandria did not survive to our days. In 48 to 47 BC, Julius Caesar intervened in the dynastic war between Cleopatra and her brother Ptolemy XIII. As a result of military actions in Alexandria, a fire broke out. The library was also set on fire and a huge number of books burned. For many years, there were attempts to restore the library, but after Cleopatra's death, Alexandria became a Roman province, and the passion for science in this city faded. To this day, it is not known exactly under what circumstances the library was completely destroyed. Historians have several versions about this. Perhaps it was destroyed by Christians when Emperor Theodosius ordered the destruction of all pagan temples and monuments. According to another version, a huge number of books were taken to Constantinople. Either way, together with the library, the most valuable originals of the works of ancient philosophers and scientists perished. And that's all for now. If you liked this video, don't forget to rate it, subscribe to the channel, and click the bell. Your activity is the best reward for me. Thank you for your attention. See you soon. Goodbye.